All right, boy, he is a newborn king. Glory to God. And the, and the Lord is here with us, and he inhabits us, and we are looking for the Lord to make a tremendous difference in our life. I, I think one of the things about Christmas that, uh, that fits Christmas more than any other time of the year is, uh, is the joy of Christmas. And in this transition time, uh, the couple of weeks before Christmas, uh, you know, where we're, our hearts are turned toward Christmas themes and we're hearing Christmas music and we're experiencing Christmas shows and, and things on TV. And, and so it's, uh, it's kind of a transition time because it's really not, it's not right at Christmas, but it, we are approaching it. And I was thinking, you know, and of course as pastors, uh, maybe this is a little bit too much inside baseball, but as pastors, when you get to seasons like this, like Easter and Christmas and times like that, of course, you're always looking for what the Lord might say uh, to us this year. And uh, because I've been in the ministry for 48 years, uh, I've preached 48 Christmases. So, uh, and sometimes two or three messages over the month of December, sometimes only one message. It just kind of depends on how the Lord was doing. So, in other words, what I'm saying is I have lots of things that, uh, that are already prepared and, and, and uh, you know, I've, been, I've used uh, many times because Christmas has a very limited amount of material about it. I, I know you've noticed this if you read your Bible. There's just not a whole, there's just not a whole lot about Christmas, just uh, basically the story of Mary's conception and the angel visiting her and then the birth of Jesus and the manger and the star and the shepherds and then later the wise men come to, to the house when Jesus is about two years old, roughly. I don't know why everybody always puts the wise men around the manger because they were not there. They, were, they just started. When, when he was born, the wise men saw the star in the east and they began to follow the star. It took them about two years to get there and we know that that because the scripture says when they got there, it says literally they went to the house where the young child was and they gave the gifts and so forth. And then Herod tried to kill all the babies two years old and under, which tells you that Herod thinks he was about two years old, to try to get rid of the Messiah and God had delivered them down to Egypt. But anyway, so this is, the, this, <laughs> this is Christmas. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm looking and I'm, I'm thinking, all right, Lord, uh, what, what, would be, what would be something that would, uh, that would, that would speak to us uh, in, in, the, in this couple of weeks before, before Christmas? Uh, and, and believe it or not, the Lord led me to, a, to a, 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 an incident that happened in Jesus' life that happened after he became a man. And I know you'll be familiar with the, the incident, and it was where Jesus goes to a wedding, and when he's at the wedding, the wine runs out. Now, I know many of you may not know this, but I was brought up or... Uh, I started going to church. I went to a, a Baptist church in the country. And, you know, we were taught that uh, alcohol was a no-no, um, you know, couldn't dance, uh, couldn't have any drums or guitars in the church and stuff like that. I mean, it was very strict, and, and that's what I was brought up in. And I pastored Baptist churches all my life up until this church, which is a non-denominational church. But uh, I'm just saying that to say that this particular story about Jesus turning water into wine has always been a particularly uh, uncomfortable, <laughs> uncomfortable kind of story for somebody that was brought up to, to believe that, man, alcohol was like, you know, just wicked, evil devil. Uh, and Jesus obviously turns it into real wine. Uh, it's not the grape juice stuff. It's not that, I mean, the, the guy drinks it and says, hey, you, you kept the best to last. Uh, you know, most people put the wine out, the best out early. And then when people get, you know, pretty tipsy and can't function good anymore, then they throw out the junk. And uh, so everybody doesn't know the difference. But anyway, so it was very difficult to do this. But this is the, this is the event that the, that the Lord led me to. And, and let me just... Uh, let me just get to it, all right? And, and let's see if the Lord will speak to, to our heart. Let's start this way. Unlike, Ma unlike Matthew and Luke, who give us many details about the birth of Christ, they talk to us about the angels, the star, the shepherd, the manger, um, everything, all the little details about the actual birth of Jesus. John is different. He's, he's quite different from them because John goes back to the beginning 
And I mean, I'm talking way back to the beginning. Let me just read the first verse of the first chapter of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And skip down to verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But John says, all right, in the beginning was the word. So John backs away from the manger, and John says, all right, what I want to say about, about, about the, the, the manger is that the same God that was made flesh that's lying there in a manger, that this God was pre-existent to everything in the cosmos. Everything was made by him. In other words, uh, the world that Christ came to was created by the word that existed before the world he created existed. That, that'll, that'll tangle you up a little bit, won't it? That's about like take a thing about eternity. You know, when does it start and when does it end? But Christ was here. John said, I just want you to know that this one that you're looking in the, at in the manger is the one that created everything. And so sometimes it's just nice, I think, to zoom back just a little bit and, and, and to remind ourselves that while God came in the most fragile form possible, a tiny infant in a, babe, in a manger that was fragile and, and, and weak and, and vulnerable, that what they were actually looking at in the manger was the infinite one as an infant born into this world. So in the beginning, John says, the word was with God and the word was God and he was in heaven and, and, and had a job to do on earth. And so before the foundations of the world were even laid, God was preparing to solve the problem that the world was going to have that kept them separated from himself, from having fellowship or relationship with him. God was already in the process of solving that issue even before the foundations of the world were laid. I'm just saying this because God made many intrusions into the world before he actually became flesh and dwelt among us. But I want to remind you now, even though these intrusions were made all along the way, God was not searching for an answer. I know many people, they'll read about the covenant God made with Abraham, and they'll read about the covenant as if somehow God thought that that was gonna make everything okay. Before the foundations of the world, God knew that wasn't gonna make everything okay. The covenant was good, but it was a good place to start, but it wasn't going to bring salvation to this earth. And then God gave Moses the law and the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were such a set of standards that were so strict that no human could ever keep those standards. They weren't going to be the answer. God gave us the Ten Commandments to show us how weak we were and the fact that we had to have a Savior because we couldn't live up to this set of standards and ideals that God had put down. And then God spoke to David, and God called David a man after his own heart. And God allowed Israel to have a king, and the king was David. And David became the father of prayer praise, wrote the Psalms, and taught us how to praise the Lord and how to worship the Lord. And praise is a wonderful thing, and worship is a wonderful thing, but it's a tool that God uses. It's never intended to do the job of saving our soul. And then God spoke to the prophets, and God said to the prophets, I'm going to give you some words to speak, and you speak the words that I give you to speak, but still the hearts of the fathers would not turn back to the children. And so God gave his own answer. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so God sends the word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld from the, from the word that dwelt with us, we beheld the glory of, of God. And of course, God wants to send the word to the world in a way that reflects 
his purpose and his plan because God could send the word to the world any way he chose. He could have sent the word to the temple in Jerusalem and present him as the king of kings. He could have sent him to the holy of holies in the temple. There wasn't an ark there, but of course the word's glory would have filled the whole place. But God doesn't send him to the temple. God doesn't send him to a synagogue. God doesn't send him to a holy of holies separated out in some holy place. God says, I'm gonna send you into the world, but I'm gonna send you through the servant service entrance. How I many of you have ever entered a business through the service entrance? It's, it's nasty, isn't it? I mean, it's where all the workers go in. It's where all the supplies go in. It's the service entrance of the place. It's usually the back door, and it, nobody ever notices it or sees it. And so God sends the word to the world through the service entrance. And here's what it looked like, Luke chapter two, verse one. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Cyrenius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So the word in this fragile, tiny, infant form was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And just so you'll know, the shepherds were the lowest tote on the totem pole. The shepherds were the, the social outcast of Israel. You could not get lower in social standing than the shepherds were. No one could be more common than shepherds were. And so God says, send the shepherds an invitation. And verse nine, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were greatly afraid. I like the old King James words, so afraid. That's just, that fits, they were so afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Look, which shall be to all people, all people. Oh, what does all mean? All means what? Everybody, red, yellow, black, white, Tall, short, uh, skinny, gravitationally challenged. Uh, you know, <laughs> send, send them to all people. So here's another group of people that are invited. Just everybody, for there is born to you. And, and when I read that, I, I like to kind of point at myself and go, for, un, for, 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 for there is born to you. Everybody do that, to you to you, and look at your neighbor and say, and to you, and, and look at your other and say, and to you, and to you, and to you. Ask, hey, ask him, have you gotten your invitation? <laughs> because he, he's born to you. All right, is born to you in this, this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So God says, I'm gonna give you a sign because evidently this birth of the word coming to the world, the infinite becoming an infant was such a common, he, he did it in so, such a common way that God said, you'll miss this if I don't give you a sign to watch. And so Jesus is born and, 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 and comes into this world and he looks so common that most people miss him. But you know that Jesus didn't stay an infant that Jesus grew up. We don't have much about the, the, the childhood and the early teenager years and even the 20s. We don't have much information about it. Uh, a lot of it is in these couple of verses right here. Uh, verse 39 and 40, same chapter we were reading. So when Joseph and Mary had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong in spirit 
filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And it was about 30 years old when Jesus entered his ministry. So Jesus, from the time he was born and all the way through his lifetime until he gets up right about 30 years old, Jesus grows in wisdom and nature and favor with God and so forth. And when he gets to be about 30 years old, um, the first thing he has to do is he has to pick his team because you got to get the word out now. This is the start of a ministry. The Savior of the world is here. Jesus is the Savior of the world. This is how God intends for the whole world to come to him. So this is a big task, and you got to have the right team, and it's a big job, and you're going to have to do it pretty quick because in about three years, he's going to be crucified, so they don't have very much time. So Jesus got to pick his team, so he goes over to the seminary. Is that right? No, no, he doesn't go to a seminary. Uh, 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 a divinity school. He goes to a divinity school. Yeah. No, uh, Bible college. He goes to Bible college and gets his guys. No, no, look, this is how he got his guys. John 1. Again, the next day, John stood with his two disciples, with two of the disciples, two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist, by the way. John the Baptist has been charged with, he's six months older than Jesus. He's his cousin, he's Jesus' cousin. And uh, he's been charged to make the way for the Messiah, to prepare the way, to make the path straight for the Messiah to come in. So John is a forerunner and he's telling the world, get ready because the Messiah's coming. And he's preaching that message, making a way for Jesus. And he is standing there with two of his disciples when Jesus passes by and looking at Jesus as he walked, as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. So he who was sent to make the way gets out of the way and tells his disciples, follow him because he's the one I've been preaching about. So the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. You mean that foul mouth Peter has gotten invited to come with Jesus? You know what, I'm sure, I'm sure the other disciples are probably sitting there going, I wonder who invited him, you know? Oh my Lord, he's, he's got a bad reputation. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, look at what Jesus said. You are Simon. Now, Simon means tiny, tiny pebble, like sand. Uh, so Jesus is saying, your name says that you are shifty, that you are unstable, you're sandy, you know. You, you, I, I'm gonna change your name, and your name's not gonna be sandy anymore. It's gonna be Cephas which means like a giant boulder. So you're gonna be like a giant rock. So I'm just saying that Jesus didn't get uh, sidetracked by Peter's reputation. He, he saw the potential in Peter and he said, Peter, you're invited. Come on, I need you. And, and the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and he said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? So in other words, Nathanael tries to insult Jesus' hometown and uh, yeah, dump on his hometown. But Jesus doesn't get sidetracked on that kind of junk either. And he invites Nathaniel to come. Philip said to him, come and see. Hey, it's good to be invited, isn't it? Have you ever been any place where you weren't invited? Did you, did you, did you feel comfortable <laughs> there? Most of the time when we're not invited, we just kind of feel uncomfortable, you know, unsettled about this thing. I'm sure that I feel like I think the shepherds felt. You know, I never thought that God would ever invite me. I never thought God would call me to anything unique to work for him in any way. Uh, I was surprised w when God actually called me, but he did, and because he did, I'm here sharing with you. Now, I don't know if you've thought about this, 
But why are you here? You are here because God invited you. And, and myself included, not just you, are probably saying, in spite of myself, he invited me. I mean, he, he saw what I did. He heard what I said. He knows what I'm thinking in my mind, and yet he still invited me. And look what he invited us to. Verse 51, one of the last verses in this chapter. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In other words, that's where we're going. That's our promise. Where is he taken? He invited us, and where did he invite us to? We're going to heaven with him, and we're going to see angels ascending and descending, and we're going to see the Son of God there. But anyway, Jesus gets his team. He's got his men, and he's got them out, and, and they're all pumped up, and they're excited about getting out and getting this ministry going because now they ha they're with Jesus. He's the hottest thing since lights toast around Israel and they need to go and they need to get the word out. And so they're pumped up and they're excited about getting it going. They got such a short time to get it done and they're all kind of rallying around. Let's go, all right, come on guys. Let's get out there and talk to people. Let's tell people, let's let Jesus show who he is. Let's go. And Jesus says, yeah, let's go. But first, we got, we got to go down here to this wedding. And I'm sure it kind of burst the disciples' bubble a little bit. Like, wedding? Man, we only have a short time. Why are we wasting our time at a wedding? Jesus, why do we have to go to a wedding? And Jesus said, well, I RSVP'd, and, um, and, and Mama's going to be there. And so, you know, we're going to have to go down there and touch base at least, you know. Now, I mean, Jesus wasn't officiating the wedding or anything. He just was invited. And she said, okay, well, we got to go down there and at least make an appearance at the wedding because, you know, Mama, uh, she'll be hot if, if we don't at least show up for a minute. So John 2, verse 1, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So there's this young couple, nameless. Nobody knows who they are. They're so unimportant that nobody would even know their name. It doesn't matter what their name would be, right? But they obviously said to Jesus, hey, life won't be the same without you. Our wedding won't be the same. Jesus, would you come to our wedding? It would just be great if you'd come to our wedding. And Jesus must have said, yeah, I come to wedding. Uh, Kind of, what can I say? All right, yeah, I come to the wedding. And notice verse three. And when they ran out of wine, now, you need to know this. In the Bible, wine is always a symbol of joy. When you see wine in the word, it's talking about, it's, it's, it's symbolizing joy. So, when the wine is gone, the joy is gone. Right? <laughs> so, so I see some of you have some experience with this. Um, I don't even have to explain that point, do I? Uh, no. So the verse goes on to say, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, why do you want to involve me? My hour has not yet come. Mama, why do you want me to get involved in this? That's what he said to her. I, my hour's not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. So it's surprising that to see Jesus at a wedding when time is so short and demand is so high, he's not officiating, and, 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 but he's there. And, and, and I'm just surprised that he would take the time to go there given the conditions that he was under at the time. So what brought Jesus to the wedding? That's what inquiring minds want to know, right? What brought him? If things are so busy and times are so hectic, what brought him to this wedding? Why did he go to the wedding? Well, I can tell you why he went because it's in the scripture right here. Um, why did he take time out of his super busy schedule to go to a wedding? Why go to a wedding in Cana of Galilee? By the way, if you, if you don't know this, Cana was such a insignificant place that it's not even on the map anymore. You can get a map of Israel, you can't find Cana. 
because it's not even on the map anymore. Now, if you go over there, I'll tell you what you'll find. The, the Jewish uh, people that lead the tours will show you where Cana is. The, the, I mean, they, they know where everything is, you know what I mean? They, they, they'll show you anything you want to see. <laughs> that'll, that'll make it better. But they don't know where Cana is either. I'm just going to tell you that. So, so here he is. Why in the world would he go to a wedding at a place where uh, they, nobody even knows their name and a, at a little town that nobody, they're not even on the map anymore? Well, when he gets to the wedding, uh, they run out of wine. Uh, maybe they got a big crowd there. Maybe they got more than they expected. Maybe they got some big drinkers, you know. Some people just get to weddings like that and they just kind of go overboard with their drinking. Or maybe it was both, you know. But for some reason, uh, they run out of wine. And, and, and of course, this is going to be a tremendous embarrassment for the whole family and so forth. And then, then while Jesus is at the wedding, they run out of wine, and then Jesus, according to the way some translations say it, it's Jesus transforms water into wine. And I like that word transforms. You know, we say Jesus turned water into wine. But some of the translations use a more descriptive word where he transforms this water into wine. And I thought about that, uh, and I like that word because that's what Jesus is, isn't he, really? He's a transformer. Jesus transforms things, right? Yeah, he, he not only can trans, transform water into wine, he can transfer, transfer uh, sorrow into joy, right? He can transfer ashes into beauty, right? He can, he can, he can transform uh, heaviness into praise. He can transform li uh, death into life. So yeah, yeah, right. A sinner to a saint. <laughs> yeah, help me preach it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So Jesus, everything is going well. Everything's scooting along fine. The wine is flowing. The music is playing. The people are dancing. Everybody's happy. And then they ran out of the ran out of wine. Now, it, now, isn't that the way it goes? I mean, everything's going good until something happens that stops the flow. Like Uncle Henry comes into the party, you know. I mean, everybody knows when Uncle Henry comes in, he's going to drink too much, he's going to get too loud. He doesn't have any filters, and he's going to embarrass everybody. So when Uncle Henry comes in, the flow stops. Or Sister Susie with all of her rules and regulations and all of that kind of stuff. And that's what happens here. Everything's going good. Wine's good. Dancing's good. People are having fun. Wedding's going fine. Everything's going at, uh, according to schedule. And then all of a sudden, something comes in that stops the flow of all of the joy and all of the wedding. They run out of wine. It's like, boom, everything's going great. And then, boom, <laughs> no way. They ran out of wine. What a social embarrassment. What a family oh, this is going to be a scandal all over town. These people were not prepared enough and it's going to be bad for them and terrible for them. Well, I don't know where the place was and I don't know who the people were, but the Bible says that what Jesus did next was the first sign in his whole ministry to declare who he is and to reveal his glory. Yes. John 2, look verse 11. In this, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. Look at this. And his disciples believed in him. So the disciples saw his glory and they believed in him at the wedding where Jesus turns water and wine. Now, that's a great result. But what brought Jesus there in the first place? Very simple. One verse tells you, here it is, verse 2 of John 2. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. They were invited and they came. So, why did he go? Because he was invited. And you will be surprised where God will show up when he's invited. You see, God just doesn't show up at church. God doesn't just show up when you're in your mountaintop experiences. The most famous 
chapter in the world as far as I know, and everybody knows what this chapter says, even if they don't know the Lord. Psalm 23. What does Psalm 23 say? And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. So he will show up in the valley of the shadow of death and walk with you if he's invited. So why, why a wedding of all places in a tiny little town with unimportant people? Why did Jesus choose this place to reveal his glory, to begin his ministry in this tiny little spot of nothingness, not in some big elaborate show, not in the temple in Jerusalem or on the marketplace where everybody could see and all of the people could be wowed and amazed. It was in this tiny little place. I think it was that Jesus wanted to show us that the power of God is active even in the mundane places of life. And as a matter of fact, I don't think you could get a better title for a Christmas message than the miraculous in the mundane. I mean, we always think of God doing miraculous things and big, powerful things. But God does great things and powerful things in even the simplest, most mundane areas of life. God shows up where he's invited. Jesus was not the wedding crasher. Jesus did not just all of a sudden decide, hey, I want to go and uh, crash this wedding and you guys, hey, come go with me. No, he was invited to this wedding and he will show up in your car if you invite him. He will show up in your kitchen if you invite him. He will show up in your closet if you'll invite him because Jesus goes where he's invited, where Jesus is welcomed. Jesus comes. You know one of the reasons why we praise and worship like we do? We play the music loud. We try to get the spirit of, of, of all of us up and lifted and moving and, and forward. You know why we do all of that? Because we want Jesus to know that he is welcomed in this place. When we sing our praises to him, when we worship him, this says to God, you are welcomed in this place. And when you, when you reach out, I, I thought about this today. I'm, I'm standing there and I'm just reaching my hands up to God. And, and when I reach my hands up to God, this is like a little child reaching up uh, to, the, to the power of the universe. And God, the power of the universe comes down through the cosmos of time and, and, and touches me and works in, my, in the places of my life that are so necessary for him to work. And, and, and the word became flesh. So the word goes to a wedding because the word wants the world to know I show up where I'm welcomed. So have you invited Christ? And I know this sounds like a, a, one of those mundane questions, but have you invited Christ into your Christmas? Because if you haven't invited him, He'll let you go through the whole season without him being there, all stressed out, all wrung out, full of anxiety and stress, if you choose that. But he'll show up if you will invite him. And he will perform in your life if you will invite him. Because the truth is, we have to live with what we invite into our life. If I invite stress, stress is gonna come. Now, it's probably gonna show up in January <laughs> when, I, when I get the bill for all of this stuff that I'm buying in December, but stress is gonna show up. Why? Because I invited it. Discouragement, if you invite discouragement in your life, discouragement is gonna show up. Now, I'm not saying that we can control every single thing that happens in our life because we all know we can't control every single thing that happens in our life, but lots of times, discouragement and heartaches and stress and anxiety and all those show up in our lives because we've invited them into our lives. And they ran out of wine, they ran out of joy. Have you ever run out of joy? I mean, you may be running low on joy right now. Well, all I can say is it was a good thing that Jesus was at the wedding because the wedding was in a moment of crisis. And I'm so glad that Mary knew what to do 
And this ought to answer the question. You know, there's a song that starts, the title of the song is Mary, Did You Know? This ought to answer that question. Yes, she did know. And she says, go, go get Jesus. Uh, he can do something about this. Because this passage is really all about expectations, right? You got people there. You have guests there. And the guests are walking around with these red solo cups. And they're, and they're, and they're, and they're looking for the bar, but they can't find the bar because the bar's closed. You know why the bar's closed? Because they ran out of wine. And so their expectations are not being met. Here you have the Son of God at this wedding. I mean, he's not supposed to be at a wedding. What's he doing at a wedding? He's supposed to be in a synagogue, not at a wedding out there in the middle of nowhere. I mean, the religious world is expecting Jesus to show up looking like Superman, but here's Jesus showing up looking like Clark Kent, you know? And they don't recognize him. So, so, so Jesus will show up at a wedding. He's just chilling uh, every day, ordinary situation in life, just like he'll show up in any ordinary, everyday situation in your life. Talking, riding with you to work, uh, washing dishes with you, uh, vacuuming the floor with, with you, working on your automobile with you. He will show up where he is invited. And I'm not even saying that you have to give him a formal invitation. Like, thou great one from heaven, wilt thou come down and fellowship with me today? No, you don't have to give him a formal, invi a, a, a formal invitation. All you have to do is create an environment for him to inhabit. You know, what, you know what Paul said in Philippians 4? Paul said, think on these things. Paul said, if you'll think on these things, That'll create an environment in your spirit and in your mind where Jesus can step out of heaven and come down and step in your life. But in order to invite him, you gotta have room for him. So in order to have Jesus in your life, some other stuff is probably gonna have to go because you don't have room for him. In order to, for him to come, he's got to have some room, so some stuff has got to be out of your life. Let me give you just a few of these unwelcome guests, and I'm not going to preach on them, but I just want to name them for you. Here are some unwelcome guests that you need to look at and say, uh, you don't have to go home, but you got to get out of here. Out. Jesus is coming. Here's one. Fear. Fear's got to go. Pride. Guilt. Blame. <laughs> Love, greed. <laughs> I mean, you could just keep going down the list. You are not welcome here. I'm inviting Jesus, and in order for him to be here, you must go. And then Mary does what only a mother could do. Verse three, and they ran out of wine, and the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, this may sound like a request, but notice there's no question mark there. She, Mary's doing what mamas do all the time. They say something like that, and it sounds like a request, but it's really not a request, is it? It's really a, a, a command, you know. They have no wine. In other words, do something about this. <laughs> you got the power to do it, do something about this. And then look what Jesus said. Jesus said to her, woman, mama, why, why, do, you want, why do you want to involve me in this? My hour's not yet come. So here's the second. Look, if your joy is running low, there are two things that are necessary for you to do. Number one is invite. Mary invited Jesus into the situation. Mary, was, Jesus was invited to the wedding. God shows up where he is invited. The second thing here is you must get involved Mary, he gets invited to the wedding. Now, Mary is trying to get him involved and get the others involved in the situation. Now, notice this. Jesus doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Mary says, they ran out of wine. Jesus says, so? So what? I ain't got nothing to do with me. And uh, I don't know about, you know, I've, I've preached this passage, this story many times, and it always feels uncomfortable right there. As a matter of fact, I changed some of the words in the sentence so that you could get a better feel for what he actually said. 
The King James makes it even more abrupt than that. You know, he says, woman, um, what is that to me? My hour has not yet come. And it sounds like Jesus is being totally selfish and that he just doesn't want to be bothered with whatever. And it's kind of awkward and it feels uncomfortable what happens there in that, in that place. But, but notice what Mary says. Mary then says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Mary, and Mary says it to the servants and not to Jesus. Why did she tell the servants whatever he says? She didn't talk to Jesus. She talked to the servants. Because, now this is just my supposition, but I think it's because she knows that Jesus is not going to get involved unless they get involved. So she looks at the servants and she says, look, I know him. I'm his mama. I can beg, I can cry, I can try to put him on a guilt trip, but he's not gonna move until they do. Because remember, Mary has some experience with this kind of thing. 30 years ago, there was an angel sent from heaven to a teenage girl with a virgin womb and the angel said to her, you're going to bring forth a son. And she said to the angel, how can this be? And the angel says, don't even worry about it. The spirit of God will overshadow you and the power of God will come upon you and you will give birth to something that you don't even understand. And Mary said, behold, I am your servant. May it be so to me. The word is servant. You see, Mary said to the angel, I'm your servant. And whatever, whatever the master wants, that's what the servant does. So the key word is servant. I am your servant. So in verse five, his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Because Jesus is not a baby anymore. And Jesus is not a promise anymore. Jesus is a man. A man who's standing there at a wedding and the people are out of wine. And Mary turns to the servants and says to them, if you will get involved, he'll get involved. And you do whatever. Look, just make it simple. Don't try to make it complicated. Just do what he says. That, that, that's, that's all you got to do. Verse 6, now there were set there six water pots of stone uh, made out of clay, actually, according to the manner of the purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. So the inference here is that these jars that they're talking about were right there. I mean, they were just there. Nobody probably had noticed them because they're just common clay jars. I mean, they're pretty big. Uh, they hold 20 to 30 gallons. I mean, you know what a five-gallon bucket is. So you got five or six of those five-gallon buckets. Uh, you got a stone pot that big. That's a pretty big pot. But it is common. It not, it's not fancy, and it's used for common everyday purposes. And evidently, it's sitting somewhere pretty close. It's nearby. It's not far off. And Jesus said, all right, look over there at those ordinary pots. I want to use those ordinary pots right over there to display my glory. I want to use those ordinary things that people walk by and never notice them in order to reveal my glory and display myself to this, to this world. So Jesus says, I want those, those pots, those overlooked pots over there. And just to remind you now, we're in a town that is so insignificant, it's not even on the map with people that are unimportant and aren't even named. But Jesus says, I wanna do it at this moment. I wanna reveal my glory. I wanna do the, an extraordinary thing at an ordinary moment. And so Jesus tells them to take the six 
stone jars. And verse seven, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. Not with wine, but with water. Fill the, wa fill the water pots with water and they filled them to the brim. Okay, so they needed wine, but he pointed to water. Uh, I think we often miss what we need because we're looking for what we want. They needed wine. Jesus pointed to the water pots and said, fill it with water. And so the servants go and they fill the pots up we want God to show up in, in some big way and we miss God's showing up in the small things of life because we think he's gonna, he only does those big things. And we want God to do something spectacular, but God does those small things in life and we often miss it. And you know, I, I think this is the secret of Christmas. The secret of Christmas is to get involved. I mean, with common stuff, with every, everyday stuff, with or, ordinary stuff. I mean, here, here's what I'm talking about. Here, here's what we do. We stand over here with our arms crossed and we say, God, fill me with joy. And God says, if you will rejoice, you'll be filled with joy. God, uh, I need peace. Fill me with peace. God says, if you believe me, That'll fill you with peace. God, I want comfort. Well, if you'll reach around and love somebody like you love yourself, you can be comforted in life. I mean, we want God to do supernatural, miraculous things in our life without us being involved at all. I'm just saying that God will go with you. God is comfortable in chaos. He will go with you if he's invited. Let me read verse uh, eight. And he said to them, draw, draw, some, draw some out now. They, they, he's turned them into wine. Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from. <coughs> See, some, peop some, some people don't know that what looks like joy now uh, a few moments ago was sorrow. Uh, you know, but they don't know. The master doesn't know, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. So the master is tasting the product. The servants know the process. They know what happened with this water. I mean, sometimes... It's out of sadness that God produces joy, right? Sometimes it's, it, 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 it's out, of, out of strength that God uh, works loneliness out of our life. Sometimes you don't know that God is all you need until God is all you have. The process. And the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. Now, my only question to end this with is, uh, could it be that God still does the same thing now? Uh, the best of your life, could it be that God has saved the best until now? and that the rest of your life is gonna be better than the last of your life. In other words, your best years are ahead of you and not behind you. You know, it's very hard to imagine this in this time in which we're living because it's so drastically bizarre. And you know God is in it. You know God is doing it. It doesn't even make any sense. You know God's hand is all in that. But what if God, what if God uh, took all of your defeats in 2022 and turned them into victories? What if God saved the best until now? It's interesting here that the number six is used and 
you know, anytime you see biblical numerics, you see numbers used in the Bible, it always captures your attention. And here there are six jars. Six in the Bible is the number for the weakness of man. Man was created on the sixth day. Seven is the number of completion. God completed the creation on the seventh day and he rested. Seven is used to represent God, to represent completeness, uh, fullness, uh, authority. Six is always used to, to symbolize uh, the weakness of humanity, that somehow um, the weakness of man is always just a little bit short of, of perfection and completeness in life. And when you see six water pots being used, now this is just the way I thought when I saw it. Why did Jesus do his first miracle? This is the first miracle that Jesus ever did to begin his ministry. Why did he do this first miracle and display his glory using six jars? And my conclusion is, could it be that you are the seventh? He used six common jars of clay, earthen vessels. Could it be because he wanted to use us as the seventh? What you saying, Pastor? I'm saying you're a miracle. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the glory of God is revealed in you on this earth and that I am the place where God pours his glory and that I am the miracle of God in process. And, and, and if I invite him and I welcome him, then God wants to fill you and God wants to change you and God wants to reflect his glory in us, in you and I. So at Christmas, don't get so wide and so broad and so, and so attracted to these gigantic things in life that we, that we miss the joy of Christ because we don't invite him in. Invite Christ this Christmas uh, in this season of your life. Welcome him into your life and he will go where he's welcome. All right, let's bow our head just a moment.